Let it rip, Ryan. <laughs> All right, we're there. <laughs> Gang, this is our new album. You've arrived at the uh, at the listening party for our album. And uh, yeah, it's going to be. It's our album is called Love Lore, and and we're gonna we're gonna just get like introduce it for like five minutes. <laughs> yeah, there it goes. <laughs> and we're gonna sort of explain uh, what it is for like five minutes. Satomi so couldn't be with us, but her picture is here. <laughs> we got Ed Rodriguez who plays guitar on the record. Um, we got uh, Mundi Faniel Mundi, who wrote um, an essay uh, for the, uh, for, well, I didn't explain that part. There's going to be a poster, and he wrote the essay on, uh, that's going to be on the poster that's like about the themes of the record. Then we got John Dietrich, <coughs> who also played guitar on the record, and he sang a little bit. You have to pay very close attention to hear the part where he sang. Do you remember when you sang, John? Barely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we got the person speaking. That's me, Moby Dick. I. Uh, <laughs> what's the guy's name? What's the, uh, ben, what, what's the uh, what's the yeah. what's the author's name? Oh, Melville. Melville. I'm yeah. Herman Melville. And then we got Ben Pickett, who. Uh, uh, well, I don't know. Maybe we should start with you, Ben. Why are you even here? What what role did you play on this record? Sure, I could start. Um, <laughs> well, uh, I was I am a music historian and an old friend of the band and a fan of the band, and I got an invitation to um, to curate a small portion of a bigger festival called Time Spans in the summer of 2019, yeah. and. The little mini festival was supposed to be about experimental music or something called after experimental music. And I, among many other artists, I invited Deerhoof to kind of think with me about what <clears throat> they might want to do for an event like that and to think creatively about the tradition of the avant-garde and <laughs> recording. I mean, first the first thing that happened was we had to get over our total... Uh, shock and confusion about why we would be playing a new music festival in the first place, you know, contemporary <laughs> classical. <laughs> That's right, yeah. And then we had yeah. to think about what what we could do, the kind of project we could make that would take advantage of the resources of a festival like that and the a venue that wouldn't be like a normal rock venue and that could pay the band a fee that was high enough that they could actually get together and set aside time in their year to work on a, something special, which is, you know, eventually what you guys did. <laughs> <laughs> I see in the chat that somebody has identified you, Ben, not just as what you described, but also the author of the uh, Henry Cow biography that came out this year, <clears throat> which is an excellent, incredibly thorough book. Um, so yeah, so we came up with this idea. Uh, well, Deerhoff came up with a with a bunch of ideas of uh, like it would be like sort of Ben would be like, why don't you, why don't you take this um, record by Luciano Berrio and just learn it note for note and cover the whole thing for the concert, and then and then Deerhoff would come back and be like, why don't we just play our regular set and like throw in a couple extra covers or something. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, we eventually we <laughs> we sort of like Ben was really keen on this idea that we would uh, <laughs> that we would be learning music by ear from records rather than rather than um, like, you know, not like academics like that would go to the score, not like classical musicians who would read the score or whatever, but that we would just take our favorite records um, from the 
you know, the sort of contemporary music period and learn pieces of it by ear. Or you were you wanted us to learn stuff by ear, and then we came up with this idea of doing a medley. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. Then it was like Ed and John and Satomi and I were all like, well, why don't we do this and why don't we do that? And it kind of all <laughs> whittled down to this idea of like music from the 50s to the 80s <laughs> that was all like about. Uh, it was all about progress and all about how like the future was going to become this uh, was going to be so much better than the present and so much better than the past. Um, and about this idea that we were sold during those decades uh, about progress and about how technology and how capitalism were going to were going to uh, create miracles uh, for us in the future. Um, and uh, it would be the end of work and it would be the end of disease and it would be the end of war and, and the end of poverty and stuff. And uh, we, we, so, so we started like focusing on all this music that, that was either like really like modernist, uh, like, uh, you know, the most avant-garde, uh, you know, classical music, which, <laughs> which kind of like the only thing that all of us in Deerhoof actually all like. <laughs> like our our uh, musical tastes are like completely clash with each other, but but uh, that's the one thing we are, we're, we've always all been into independently is like we all for some reason love like really um, high modernist uh, you know like um, avant garde classical music, and, uh, so then we were like trying to like pick out stuff from from records like that, um, and then we were also looking at like. <laughs> like different kinds of pop music that also were all about the promise of how music was becoming so sophisticated and so artistic and so forward looking. And then there was also like thrown in there this kind of like <laughs> music that sort of critiqued that and said like, you know, are we sure that all of these promises are really coming true? Because it sure seems like <laughs> a lot of the, uh, ills that are supposedly being cured by um, by um, by the uh, post-war um, capitalist explosion um, are actually worse now than they were before. Um, and so a lot of uh, Afrofuturist music that that sort of critiqued it and, and called it into question and, and proposed its own kind of uh, alternate solutions. Um, anyway. <laughs> Why am I talking so much? <laughs> so then that's, a, then the, I don't know, then that's how it connected to Graeber because we, we realized, you know, suddenly we hit on this thing of like, there was that David Graeber article called, um, um, it was uh, uh, of flying cars and the declining rate of profit. That was like, that was the whole theme. We realized that that, that was something we could try to um, communicate with, uh, with the music we chose. Um, and, uh, and we were actually really excited to have him uh, be part of the, uh, <laughs> the chat today. Um, and I, you know, he passed away so recently, it was a complete shock. No one was expecting it. Um, so, um, you know, he's been a big inspiration for the band for several years. Um, you know, we were always kind of anarchist leaning um, and interested in history, but he was somebody who kind of like focused our thinking a lot in, in the past few years. And, and um, we were really excited to share this with him because it was kind of, it ended up thematically being all based around like his writing and his work and his ideas and stuff. And uh, so we're really sad that he can't be here, but, um, but anyway... <laughs> I don't know. One of the things that we did in this is like we ended up we read I read into a microphone uh, the first paragraph of that article while Ed and John play a um, <laughs> a note for note transcription that they figured out off of YouTube of a Derek Bailey guitar improvisation. <laughs> and I still to this day, I cannot figure out how you guys managed to figure out all of that, you know, <laughs> note for note is like so complicated, but, but like, I don't know, that's kind of what it was like making this thing. 
that we're about to play. Um, how how did you guys even like? How did you figure out how to play that? Uh, just uh, I feel like um, he meant so much to at least speaking for myself personally. Like he meant so much to me when I first start. You know, when I first started playing guitar. That I, Derek, uh, um, Derek Bailey, yeah, 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 Derek Bailey. That I, that I, uh, kind of, um, I, you know, it, it, I understood it, and and kind of, uh, it, it influenced, it influenced my, my, uh, the way that I hear music in general. So mm -hmm. when I, so, so to be, it, figuring it out was absolutely no different than than sitting down and figuring out a Led Zeppelin song or something, <laughs> you know, because the, the language, the language was so is just. Is just there, you know, and it, yeah. it's just. I mean, it is. Uh, it is. Um, you know, I not didn't really think about it, but it is like just a testament to how developed, you know, uh, the language he created. It, that is just, you know, it it could become something that that was just like, you know, a becomes a classic, <laughs> like yeah, a classic. Totally. Yeah, yeah. So it was just like listening to it, and it was pretty just, yeah, just like, oh, yeah. I remember that doing... you figured, you figured it out, and then you showed it to John. <laughs> well, that, <laughs> I posted that's... a video the other day of you guys like practicing it together on we, the couch. We each well, did that... like fifteen second chunks, and we yeah, just... yeah. We well, <laughs> oh, we had our, where, where we had uh, <laughs> we were, we were all at Greg's house, and we were we were we had like we had like um like little like deciphering sections of the house like where where you know <laughs> one person would be in a different a person would be in a different room like each figuring out one of these pieces one of these pieces and then we would all just like rush in and meet together and be like okay now i know how to play you know this stockhausen thing i know how to play the Derek Bailey thing and we exactly. just like would yeah. come running and show <laughs> each other and it was just like a lot of that was just uh um you know like time management where it was just you know <laughs> take the clipboard out in the morning and be like okay you know john's gonna be on morton feldman from uh from 8 8 a.m till 10 a.m and, <laughs> and that kind I wish of thing. Like that. <laughs> Great. And then we uh yeah we'd meet and have lunch and go back to it. <laughs> lots of avocado sandwiches yeah delicious oh yeah so this was all like a year ago. We played it almost exactly a year ago to the day. It was, uh, I guess it was last August uh, that we performed it. And then we recorded this, the, the thing that we're about to play, uh, we recorded the next day after the show. Um, we, we were feeling so good about it, like we'd been practicing and practicing. Um, <laughs> and we, ha we were so hot on this thing. We were like, we got to book some time. So we went to a really cheap studio in, in Manhattan. <laughs> booked really last minute and recorded it the next day when we had a day off before flying to Europe for tour. And, um, and then we've been, uh, we've been mixing it uh, since then. We finished it recently. I, uh, <laughs> around the time we put out Future Teenage Cave Artists, which was like in May or something, um, <laughs> uh, Muindi put a post on Instagram or something showing that he had purchased the record or, you know, the LP was spinning or something happened, you know, some picture or some video or something. <laughs> and I went to check out like, who's this person? And, and the, the newest thing, Mwindi, on your, on your uh, <laughs> page that day was, uh, <laughs> you'd written a post on, it was called Nine Theses on Power. <laughs> and it was like, you know, I was sitting there, it was just an Instagram post, but I sat there for like the next hour trying to decipher this incredibly dense, you know, <laughs> uh, basically essay that you'd written. And I'm like, I need to know this person. So, so uh, you know, I got to know you through through uh, Instagram and I realized that, that, uh, that, you know, you were also, you know, uh, familiar with uh, Graeber and, and I just thought that maybe Maybe you'd be somebody who could like try to, I don't know, write a poetic something about the themes of the record. So, um, so I don't know. Yeah. There you are. <laughs> um, uh, I guess for me, I, I feel like I'm coming at this really as like a really big fan. So I think I probably started reading Graeber and Deerhoof at about the same and listening to Deerhoof at about the same <laughs> time. 
Um, <laughs> and so for me, um, when I, I was lucky enough that when Greg asked me to do this, David Graeber mm -hmm. hadn't passed. Uh, so I could yeah. didn't have to mark his legacy in any way, but yeah. could just be inspired by him in a really mm -hmm. fun way and be inspired by this record. Um, and also when Greg asked me to do this, I remembered like this interview that Greg had given, I don't know, must be like a decade back, um, in which somebody asked him, what's the best question you've ever been asked? Uh, and, and Greg, you know, he sat back and he like looked up in the sky and, he's, and he named the two bands that were about to open for Deerhoof. Uh, and then he had, and then he mused about the fact that, well, you know, um, every time you play after someone, you're kind uh, of responding to them. You know, it's kind of like they, they, I mean, they don't know it because they're responding to a question that they've been asked by whoever right. played it, but you're responding to them. And so I really listened to this record and it has a lot of music that I love and I, I heard it as a kind of response. And then I didn't necessarily ask the question they were asking in the text, so I just had to frame it. So I wrote right. my essay that like frame their question uh, and then hopefully you listen to the record and you hear the question for yourself. It's full of like puns and, and kind of like, like little musical puns and all sorts of really fun mm -hmm. ways of like reposing questions that others have posed and then asking yeah. questions. And so I really just, <laughs> the record, and I got to write on it. Sweet. God. <laughs> That's exactly how, how I think we were feeling about it. It was like if, if music of that period from the 50s, the 80s was, was asking a question, then... <laughs> then uh, this was us trying to, you know, if not answer the question, at least respond to the question. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we're about to play. We're going to we're going to start it in a second here. Th this will be our new record, Love Lore. And uh, <laughs> and then once it's over, like, in, in, you know, whenever, like maybe, uh, you know, in, in 42 minutes or something, um, <laughs> The record will become available for streaming and download. Although there goes the album cover that Satomi made. <laughs> Satomi, with the help of Ryan uh, Hover from Joyful Noise, Satomi did all these drawings. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so it's going to be up uh, in the spirit of uh, in the spirit of uh, one um, <laughs> uh, in the spirit of. Uh, uh, of uh, opposing capitalism, it's going to be completely free. You can download it for free. Also, in the spirit of not wanting to get sued by all the uh, people we're covering, <laughs> we're not charging anything for this. But you can buy a poster um, that will be available on the Bandcamp uh, page. Um, uh, ben Pickett wrote uh, um, an essay about how this was put together that will be the text of the band campaign and kind of explain it. And then Muindi's essay will be on the poster that also includes um, <laughs> like Satomi's artwork. Um, and uh, so you can buy uh, the poster from Joyful Noise, um, but the uh, music will be completely free. And uh, I don't know, does anybody else want to say anything before we uh, press play on this thing? We're, oh, yes, there's one more thing. <laughs> there's always one more thing. One more thing is the we the right before the record starts, there's gonna be you're gonna see the Muindi's essay because it's going to be read in a voiceover um, uh, intro that uh, that Ryan and uh, um, and Muindi and our friend Candace have made uh, that uh, that that introduces the record and then the record will start. Oh, 4 p.m. Eastern. Yeah, that's when the that's when the record will officially be out on Bandcamp streaming and everything. <laughs> Where are the flying cars? The lament of a generation that knew better than to trust spinners of fairy tales, but were gullible enough 
to fall for those spin doctors that called themselves futurologists. Spinners of fairy tales asked us to hold out hope for a you catastrophe, a sudden improbable turn for the better that can never be counted on to occur, never mind to recur, and that may be the flip side of a discatastrophe, an improbable turn for the worse. Futurologists, by contrast, provided us with probable projections and visions of the future and treated catastrophic turns as mere plot devices, gimmicks that betray inexorable movements towards the end of history, a techno-utopian future, or a techno-anesthetic future. These prophets of the inevitable insisted that sooner rather than later, the logic of capitalism would provide, if not flying cars, some other vehicle to a fantastic end, the end of hunger, disease, or war. So why instead have we been offered a screen new deal and processions of computer-generated simulacra? Aye, there's the rub. For futurologists, thinking of their own futures above all else, we're less interested in fantastic ends than guiding investment and making the fantastic seem probable through modeling and projection. So instead of flying cars, we have big data and special effects, a result that has suited the richest investors, the 1%, just fine. Enter Deerhoof and other despairing merrymakers of the vernacular avant-garde, the lovers of beautiful, curious, breathing, laughing flesh. Deerhoof is not the future of music and doesn't want to be. They simply want to embrace you, here and now, in the present. Yes, you. You catastrophe, you. You improbable accident of birth, you. You don't have to be hoped for against all reason. You already exist. You just want to be embraced for what you are and what you have the potential to become. And you don't give a fuck about what future trends indicate you ought to become. You are to be loved in the no man's land between the past and the future that separates the fairy tales of bygone spinners from the future trends of spin doctors, the only place where feats of imagination, ingenuity, and iterated trial and error make a difference. Deerhoof has returned to the post-war past only to arrive at ever-present and answer questions. To leap from the ever-present past into the no-man's land of the present current, where the future and the flying cars have yet to arrive. The sonic landscape of the present where Deerhoof has landed is a blasted landscape. Love lore is a funeral for futures obliterated by projections from a toxic past, a threnody to the victims of probable futures never to come. But just like Matsutake proliferate in blasted natural landscapes and nurture wild forests, a sensitive listener will find wild oral pleasures proliferating in Deerhoof's sonic wasteland, nurturing wild vernacular musics. So listen as jingles and pomp for techno futures collapse into disillusioned chants of no future and yield to strains of Afrofuturist lore inflected so as to become delectably mundane, earthly like Matsutake. Listen and learn how to gather the forest, to laugh and stay in the wonderful present.
This empty heart, this empty hands, this mind ignoring, this body homeless. This empty hands, this body homeless, this empty heart, to him I brought, this mind ignoring. This mind ignoring. To him I brought. This empty heart. This body homeless. These empty hands. This body homeless. This mind ignoring. These empty hands. This empty heart.
fall down and lost in the mystery lost it all to a non-believer and all that's left is a girl who's loved by her mother and father
hovers over us, a sense of disappointment, a broken promise we were given as children. I am referring not to the standard false promises that children are always given about how the world is fair or how those who work hard shall be rewarded, but to a particular generational promise given to those who were children in the 50s, 60s, 70s, or 80s. One that was never quite articulated as a promise, but rather as a set of assumptions about what our adult world was supposed to be like. 
And since it was never quite promised, now that it has failed to come true, we're left confused. Indignant, but at the same time, embarrassed at our own indignation. Ashamed we were ever so silly to believe our elders to begin with. Where, in short, are the flying cars?
Right. I can't hear anybody. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. Yeah. Thank yeah, thank you for tuning in. That's, uh, we called it Love Lore. That was our, like, medley cover thing <laughs> that we worked on uh, last year. We just finished the mix a few months ago. And, um, and, uh, yeah, again, like, we we did it where, where uh, I don't know, we, like, a, Ben Pickett, who's, who's there in the corner, <laughs> invited us to play this festival, um, and wanted, it was like a contemporary music festival, <laughs> like, the other uh, participants in, in the festival were like, you know, it was like modern classical or extreme avant-garde. We were really like not sure what you know what we were going to be able to do for it. But then slowly we you know spent months like trying to like come up with some plan. And everybody just like chipped in ideas of like oh this is my favorite part of this piece or oh maybe we could add this in. And once we hit on that Graeber David Graeber essay from The Baffler about. Um, you know, about flying cars, we we realized we had a theme that kind of made it all, you know, come together and make sense. So all the music is from the 50s to the 80s, which is the time period that he was talking about in that article. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah, we played it all live in the studio the day after the show. We've sprinkled in a few bits of it here and there in shows. Like, we went to... Uh, <laughs> we went to Europe on tour the next morning and we you know we played bits of it here and there I remember there's a pretty good video of us playing it uh, playing uh, the Silver Apples thing um, from uh, in uh, in uh, Italy but uh, yeah <laughs> maybe maybe uh It, did, it took a long time to... <laughs> I'm just trying to remember, like, us us trying to learn it, you know? Like, uh, I wish Satomi was here, because it was like the three of you guys were, like, pushing it so hard, you know? There's so many notes to learn. <laughs> and, uh, and, like, you know, per Yeah. Well, can I can I jump in to ask John and Ed a question about that? Just about learning the music. Yeah. One of the things that was striking to me, sitting in, in case it isn't clear for the people who weren't there, uh, Deerhoof gave a concert that essentially sounded exactly like that for on one night. In, in a concert hall in Manhattan. And the performance, I think it, how long is that, you guys? Was it 55 minutes or an hour, maybe? Um, this is slightly shorter than, or a bit shorter than the, what we did. I think it was like 50 minutes or something. Yeah. Okay. So you, and then what, what they did the next day, Deerhoof went into the, stu uh, the studio to get this down on, on tape while they still had it in their head. But one of the striking things besides the incredible musicianship and the um, uh, uh, amazing creativity that a lot of us noticed was that Ed, for example, had no music in front of him. He had memorized the entire thing. Uh, I think that Satomi and John, you guys had, I noticed some kind of music notation or a little bit. And I think Greg had a little bit too. So could you talk a little bit about the memory question? Oh yeah, there it is, John. Well, I mean, I can talk for myself. Like I don't read music or write music. And so I, I came up with, you know, over the years I have, I've come up with my own 
little ways of writing things and like <laughs> like for the Morton Feldman thing I knew the, wh where the first note was and I would just create these patterns I don't know if you can see that but you like of uh -huh. just a, a bunch of numbers and but the song is actually faster than I can think it's not that fast but it's faster than I can think <laughs> so um so I it's wrong a, a lot of the time and um so a lot of like what you're hearing with that stuff is just Ed and I kind of both struggling to to uh, our brains are at the very edge of what we're actually capable of um, do, or at least for me, I think Ed can probably do more of that than I can. But. Well, I like I mean, in that way, like John and I've, you know, John and I have been playing together for like 25 years, so you know, uh, we kind of developed in a in a in a way where you know. It's just, it's just like breathing at this point. I can, you know, like, like a anticipate. Like we, we can follow each other so easily. It's like, it's like, I mean, like all the time it shows, all the time it shows, you know, something will be happening and I'll have my, my hand on the guitar neck and I'll be like, oh my God, what I'm doing is amazing. This sounds so great. And then I'll move my hand and nothing changes. And then that's when I realize it's been John the whole time. You know, <laughs> like, like, so we kind of, in a lot of ways we blend. But like for, for this, like for the mountain, like for me, um, I'll uh, I like to get I, I I can read music and stuff, but I I like to get off the page as quickly as possible uh, because that's um, that's the only that's the only way for me that personally that I can really feel it like inject you know emotion into it completely as if I don't have to worry about like 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 just staring at something it's like you know it's like watching a movie with subtitles yeah. Um, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was gonna say something the, about the um, oh the because the before the you showed the album, uh, Ed was talking about the this Derek Bailey thing and like I actually think I kind of got. Derek Bailey through you, Ed, sort of secondhand. I had, I heard Derek Bailey and I listened to some of it, but I think like I I felt comfortable dealing with that not because I listened to so much so much Derek Bailey, but because I you and I had played together for so long and you had yeah. Derek Bailey so much in you in you and the way you like approach the instrument and stuff. And I created my own kind of bastardized versions of like based on like you know sort of half comments that you would make about how you approached doing stuff so so uh, i don't know it's just kind of interesting it's like um several levels removed from the original thing but it's still sort of intact or whatever <laughs> uh. <laughs> what i miss <laughs> ben was talking about the show. Oh yeah, did you talk about this funding thing? I didn't, but um, uh, that's a good. That I think this could be a good way to ask a question of Muindi that I was I've been thinking about. But one of the things, at least for me, that I discovered, and I, you guys know a lot more about this than I do. Um, cause I don't, I don't curate anything ever. This was a new experience for me. Um, but what this helped me realize was that, um, time spans who programmed the event and the Earl Brown music foundation who gave you the commission and in, in particular, the executive director of that, that organization, Tomas Victor, who's a great curator. Um, they, I realized that they, those kinds of places have resources to make projects possible that otherwise you couldn't have you wouldn't have been able to do so in this case learning all this music working out how to rehearsing it uh, making cuts editing and everything that required the four of you to get together uh, exactly. over the course of the year before we had this one concert and then it was gone that's why I'm so <laughs> exactly. like <laughs> we're also glad that you were smart enough to make the recording and figure out a way to release it. But um, one of the things that I like about 
I think that Muindi is highlights really well in his essay that started the stream was how, for the most part, like if there's something like a vernacular avant-garde, it finds its position not in these kinds of fancy funding streams that remove music from the marketplace, but rather it's right in there, uh, right in there in the commercial marketplace. It finds its critical place through all of the normal channels that we all use to get music. You know, there's no pristine special place. This is, I think, Mundi, you call it, uh, do you say mon mundanely? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, use the word mundanely. So anyway, that was something that I thought that I learned through this project. And I thought that Muindi, you articulated another side of it really well. And so I just wanted to ask you what, how you would respond to that. Yeah. So so one thing that I was thinking about, um, and this actually goes back to the David Graeber piece uh, on flying cars and the declining rate of profit, is that that, that particular essay is about how... Um, you know, where it is that creative work gets done, in a sense. Uh, because Graeber's point in that article is that, you know, um, for things like flying cars to be made, like, you have to, like, one, be a little bit crazy, and you have to, like, try a lot of stuff that will just not work. Um, and okay. what you kind of need for that to happen is you have to, like, have an audience of people who are willing to, like, have people try something a little dangerous uh, and and kind of uncertain and like enjoy like both like the joys of when it succeeds and when it kind of fails and kind of like just in, like kind of have that fun. And I think that there is a kind of audience in, in the marketplace or there's just like a, a natural desire for people who are trying to like do something different and say, oh, that's kind of weird. I kind of want to like hear it. And then like waiting for that moment of yes that's it is like really really lovely but that doesn't happen if you're like trying to set the future trend or if you're trying to like wait for something good to happen you just have to like take some time and and do it and i think that you're right um a lot of these larger institutions with the funding streams they either are trying to like keep a culture alive like something that's established or they're trying to say this is going to be the future of music so let's like get in ahead and then we'll be you know there at the front line uh but there's like this this place in the commercial marketplace for people who just like enjoy hearing new things um and it's not necessarily just the commercial marketplace but it's also i feel like a lot of these things are done you know without remuneration uh until after the fact so it's just like the joy of of companionship uh, yeah. um and yeah <laughs> I mean, it just makes me think <laughs> it's 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 weird how the article itself <laughs> partly is about that, because that that period that began after the end of World War Two, as we all now know, because it's <laughs> it's finally, you know, it's sort of like a, a couple of uh, presidential elections have have brought it into public, you know, consciousness again, that the, the closest the U.S. ever came to socialism was after World War II. <laughs> and that, uh, that that was the, the 50s was the, you know, Eisenhower and then Kennedy was the height of um, public funding for the arts. <laughs> and there was this whole thing, like middle brow, music people you know anybody with a radio would tune in you know and there'd be like some new commission of some new orchestra piece by an american composer you know <laughs> and everybody heard it and at least i mean i wasn't there in the 50s but you know <laughs> uh but you know i read about it in history and 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 it's surprising to me to look back to that and to think that that it's the baby boomer generation uh, among the many ways that they rebelled against the World War II generation, or what they call the greatest generation, uh, they rebelled in many ways, fashion, music, etc. But one of the ways they rebelled was to remove, was to argue against that kind of like state funding for the arts. And it's, it's, a, it's a strange irony looking back and, and to see how it's just been this big, you know, um, uh, uh, shrinking of of uh, you know from from that where it was its peak to now socialism uh or or anything that we might describe as being kind of like 
publicly funded work or, or is particularly in the arts or whatever has shrunk to the point where now it's like the CEO of Spotify can literally, he's not American, but he can literally say publicly on purpose and want people to hear it that, look, musician, if you can't um, get your act together fast enough and put out music fast enough, there's no time for experimenting. You've got to turn out some content, you know, immediately. And if you can't catch up to that, then too bad. The, the music world is no longer for you. And so, you know, that's like, it's, I mean, every, everybody who plays music now is, is, is trying to reconcile themselves to that, to that strange reality that's been devised by <laughs> not somebody who's imagining an incredible future. It's just somebody who, who, uh, who's uh, exploiting, you know, and just wants to make a fast buck, you know, as quickly as possible. And, uh, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I think that's, that's actually one thing that I think is really interesting is that, you know, when there is state funding for the arts, it's like, well, somebody's going to get these these funds every year. Uh, and so, you know, yeah. even if there's like nothing that's going to make money soon, somebody's going to get the fund, which means that there's going to be some kind of funding for, you know, somebody doing some <laughs> kind of crazy because like, well, you know, we don't have anything necessarily new that's going to make money, but we have money for the arts. So let's just you know support an artist. And so there's like room and space. Um, but now it's, it's, it's either in the market or it's out of like complete <laughs> passion and dedication uh, that exhausts yeah. uh, you if you have to work and do it at the same time. So it's a difficult, it's a difficult conundrum mm -hmm. the artist finds himself in, and it kind of makes the artist like political in a way. Um, if they want to experiment and actually like read uh, and eat, um, yeah, yeah, art isn't political just if the lyrics are about this this uh, one topic in current events it's political um if you take a step back i mean we we have to the, the reality is we're really grateful that ben asked us to do this he kind of he kind of pressured us to do this i mean you know, in, in addition to being grateful you know i'm slightly resentful too but <laughs> um you know and the, the 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 festival you know had funding and was willing to do it like it's I, it's not something we ever expected in our entire lifetime, you know, to, to like, I mean, I guess bands get advances sometimes, you know, to make something. And that, so I, I shouldn't say it's unique to this festival. I mean, I think that, that um, record labels uh, do the same thing. Uh, they, they often advance money, um, you know that will come out of the the uh, end uh, profit, uh, but this is money for you to make the record. Um, but it, yeah, it's really funny in Deerhoof's case because we've always like <laughs> our only way to ever have made anything was we had to do everything uh, no budget, or at least that's the way we did it in the early years, and then we got so used to it that we kept doing everything totally no budget. Um, and uh, it's not like. I mean, the budget to make this was how many? How much was it, John? It was like two hundred dollars or something to to record the record, you know, or <laughs> something like that. I mean, it was a really cheap studio, the Rivington uh, Street, um, and you know, we just had it for one afternoon. But but uh, it was like no, it was like months of of like um, <laughs> of doing this instead of whatever other thing, you know, like sometimes a. You know, I make sauces and, and you know, combine spices. And, and uh, you know, I, I have other ways that I can spend time, but, you know, we spend it doing this instead. And, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I feel Ed, like I'm lucky Greg, to spend the universe. Yeah. Greg, can I add one other thing, though, about that I think is really important about that period that you cover in the repertoire oh, from, yeah, yeah. you know, the 50s to the 80s, which is that... Um, not only is there massive public funding for many things among among them the arts, but there's also a change in the consumer culture of music where, and that's what I love about your kind of solution to this project is that you, it's an album made by listeners. Right, and exactly. You're fans. showing us, right. for fans, you're showing us how you listen. And the 
interface with some of that like classical avant-garde music is not happening through the scores, even though, like it, like Ed said, you know, you can start on the page. You eventually want to get away from it, but it's it's coming through sound, straight through sound, and on the record. And I think that that's a really important um, historical shift that I feel like the your your project thematized really well. And remember, I mean, that, now would be a yeah. good time to say that <laughs> that. The, the term vernacular avant-garde was coined by you. You made that up. <laughs> and that that's a really incredibly useful uh, word because it explains exactly that, that, that something could be avant-garde, but, but that you take it uh, as a fan, you take it as a listener. It's not a homework assignment um, that you had in school, but it's like, um, and that, that was the weird thing about Deerhoof is that, <laughs> you know, every time we get together and like, okay, guys, you know, what should our next album be like? And we start sending each other, I want to make it like this and I want to make it like that. We're always like, what are you talking about? Like, like we really, our tastes do not match up. You know, we can't stand each other's musical tastes and stuff. Or whenever we tour in the, in the minivan, it's dead silent. There is absolutely no music we can agree on in the car. But the one strange thing that we all like weirdly had in common was this like love of, of avant-garde music of that period, whether it was more free jazz or whether it was more like um, orchestra music or electronic music or something like that. Uh, and so suddenly, like when you asked us to do this, everybody was like, they had all these ideas. Well, my favorite piece is this and my favorite composer is that, and, you know, and it's like, it was actually, I don't know, it was like really joyous to put together because of that, it was like, I can't wait. I've been wanting somebody to do a cover of this or to I, even just to see a live performance of this piece, you know, like some of these are obscure. Some of them are quite famous. You know, they're sort of like war horses of the modern music period or whatever. But some are kind of obscure, like that one near the beginning, um, Earl King. You know, really obscure Korean American composer. This piece, Earthlight, that's on some none such record, and I just always thought that was the most beautiful piece. And I'm like, why does nobody ever perform this piece? There's never been another recording. This piece is like, you know, my dream. And it's like, wait, we can do it. You know, yeah. <laughs> we can do it yeah. ourselves. You know, that was really yeah. fun. No, I, 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 I feel like. Like this was a uh, like a very literal um, like exercise, you know, of of what I've been doing my entire life. I mean, in uh, um, for as long as I've been listening to music, I I mainly have found inspiration in uh, a lot of classical and 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 free jazz and improvisational music. Like I. I really, I really, um, I, I, uh, I don't particularly like listening to improvised music, but I would listen to improvised <laughs> well, who music. Does? Well, you know, I mean, it's like, it's so much fun to do, but you know, it's, it's, it's to listen to, it can be a trial depending on, you know, but, but, uh, but, um, you know, uh, except when I was in groups that was, were just mainly improvising, then, then mm. like when I would listen to improvised music, then it would, it would be more immediate. It, it would make sense to me because I was in, in, you know, if I was in a, doing something that was like, you know, reflecting that it, it just, it all clicked. But, um, I would, you know, always listen to classical jazz, everything, um, in to get ideas for construction. And it was, it was never like, um, I, I, from the time I started playing music, I'd go to the library, get everything Stravinsky, like everything would just lead, you know, like my, Cage, Stravinsky, I, you know, like moving on and on, Stockhausen, yeah. uh, like moving it, you know, just like the gradual progression and finding all these things. And it was never, it, I never had um, any, any feeling like I was going to write for like a mat, like a seventy piece classical ensemble, you know, like like <laughs> like uh, like uh, not not because not because uh, not not you know not because I felt like oh I'm just like some working class kid I'm never gonna get the chance it was never it wasn't even about like whether these opportunities were open to me it was just about what can I what is happening in my life right now and what can I do what do I have around me right now and and that was it and I, it was like. You know, never, never, never really thinking about like ten years down the road. It was thinking about like I have, a, I have 
a friend who can play guitar and I have a friend who can play drums. And I have this stack of cl classical records from the store I'm working at. And I'm just going to figure out like how to do uh, do things I'm hearing, do, you know, and, and, and use these things thing, like, um, cause there's like, I, you know, there's so many, like, like, I, I remember just like, like listening to, to like a, a Richard Abrams album or something like that. And then it's just like, you know, you listen to the whole thing and all of a sudden there's a moment where it's like the piano d continues doing this while this, this part drops out. And that's enough to like make it just be like, okay, stop, yeah. hit stop. And now I'm going to write a song because yeah. that doesn't do exactly that, but it's just, just hearing those things of just yeah. like the way that these instruments interact, the, the ideas. Yeah, like, like all I, those times you wrote um, songs for Deer Hope where everybody's playing and then you make the drums stop. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, for example. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And well, then that, suddenly yeah, it yeah, sounds so much like, better and you can't figure out why. I have a good Ed story, which is I remember going to Ed's house in Minneapolis, and this would have been 24 years ago or three years ago, and he would have a, like a boom box, um, his stereo, like um, like a small cassette thing, and like I think four different you know audio things. One would have a solo, like a classical solo piano piece playing. The other one would have like a Peter Brotzman solo playing. Um, the other one would be like a, yeah like a, a Milford Graves on drum solo or something, and the other one would be like. Uh, like quartet, a yeah. solo clarinetist, and he would just sit <laughs> in the center of it, and just sit there. And wait for something interesting to happen. He'd lean forward like that. Yeah, yeah, kind of. And, <laughs> and he would wait for something interesting forward. to happen, and then make some kind of note of it. I don't even know if you actually. I don't know if you actually made notes, but you would make some yeah. mental note maybe. But that, I mean, uh, there's so much. I mean, you were spending a lot of time doing stuff like that, and it was like, and you're, and at the time you were working at a really great used record store. And so you just you would come home with like 50, like, you know, 50 record, like Luigi Nono and like whatever, like, yeah. Yeah, well, that, that's why, I mean, this, this was like, this, this just didn't seem strange at all. Like, this didn't seem like, like, uh, you know, I, I mean, it was, it, it was, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, um, you know, when, when you're not, when you're not hung up on, on genres or, or scenes or anything, you know, like, I, like, I think, I, I think, uh, I think like a lot of people, especially when you're from a small town, you know, where it's like, where it's like, you don't, uh, you don't have enough people to, to have division in scenes, like where it's just like, yeah. <laughs> it's just like, you just, exactly. you just uh, try and find connection in any way you can, because, uh, because, you know, there's, there's not enough, there's not enough of one specific thing to break down. You know, I, I think that I, 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 uh, I feel that in all of the band where it's like, we don't, we don't look down on any sort of music. We don't even like, oh, we don't, we, we, it's like the, the, everybody in the band, I don't even feel like they recognize like that there is, that there is a difference between, <laughs> between right. like classical music, rock music, anything. And, and, uh, and I mean, I, I, uh, I, I, when we were working on this, I really felt that because it was like, it was just like learning, like just, sitting down listening learning these things and then playing them and then it just sounded like it just sounded <laughs> like us you know it was it was uh, yeah. it was really really fun i mean a lot of that music is in all of us i think yeah you know, like greg you were saying this earl keen piece it's like this you know it's something that's already part of you mm -hmm. in a way you've heard it for so long and like i think a lot of this music was like that whether it, it was specific pieces or or like just the aesthetics of it or whatever yeah to totally or like like uh like with the feldman thing or the uh or the 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 veloso thing you know like i mean there was there was uh there was elements of those things that are in our you know that we we whip out all the time you know when we're playing just that just that feeling of of uh of just like you know when we're on stage and we're yeah you're you're uh you're you're feeling the air the air before the note actually hits, you know, and, right. and we're just like watching for that, for that, you know, like, we're just like, uh, like, like, like sort of connecting in, in that way. And, and, uh, and so, so it was, it felt very, very familiar. It felt really natural. So I, one thing, I, one thing that occurs to me is that <clears throat> we are talking very highfalutin terms, uh, <laughs> 
uh, and making it all sound so rosy and flowery. The reality is that when we got into the studio that day, Ed, you showed up late with the worst migraine you've ever yeah. had. And, uh, you were set up, when we were recording, you were set up uh, about two feet away from my snare drum <laughs> and yeah. nodding off between takes. You were in absolute excruciating pain the entire time, needed to leave to throw up a bunch of times, and then we'd come back and then you'd like completely nail off. It was like, it was like really one of the things yeah. I've ever witnessed, you know. Yeah. It was it, uh, getting there late for some reason. I don't know why. The only space that was still open was smack dab in front of your drum set. <laughs> I, you know, I, <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know. You know, I, I, huh. I would think everyone would be would be rushing for that spot, but no, it was, it was left open. So I had a migraine and yeah, I was I'm sitting like about feet yeah, two, two feet from your bass drum, and like. Every every bass drum note it would just like vibrate my skull, and I would just like have to like tense up. Yeah. And then the migraine was like making me nauseous, so yeah, I'd have to get up and pee. so I was just like I felt so bad. I felt like I was really just like like just loot blowing it because I was just like it, it just like you know. What did you think? Now that you hear it, what do you think? Did I you I uh, have I yeah. <laughs> I must have. I, I I I had no idea what happened that day, and uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm can, yeah, <laughs> very I, happy. Can I add one more thing, just because I yeah. know um, it, it it's amazing that there are still so many people streaming it, but I know that um, people eventually we have to start thinking about uh, finding our ending. But um, <laughs> I think that it's also really important um, to say something about the politics of um, the idea of uh, everybody listening to uh, different musics that are on record. Like, like I, and I think that Muindi's essay highlights this really well, that, that they're, the, the people who have access to those big budgets, that's institutional support, uh, in the 50s and 60s, that's a pretty small slice of humanity there. Oh my and God. What's incredible to me, just thinking of it, like as a historian, is how by the, the late 1960s, a lot of that music is available on record and a regular person can go buy it. And they can, just like or Ed it by describing, accident. or find it by accident. And just like Ed was describing, mm -hmm. um, they can put that on their record player wherever they are and think, how could I do that? How can I make something that's like that? Mm -hmm. um, I don't, maybe they don't need any of that institutional support. They don't need that um, incredible social investment in their creative practice. They'll find another way. They'll improvise a new way. Mm -hmm. um, they will imagine a different narrative of the 20th century that starts somewhere uh, distinct and is pointed in another direction. I mean, um, the most extreme example I think on here would be Sun Ra, you know? I mean, his, his version of that history starts on Saturn, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. So I, I like, I, I associate this stuff that we're talking about, genres mixing and stuff like that. I associate that personally with the power of recorded sound to articulate other narratives of late modernity, uh, um, other a narrative of the 20th century that is defined by decolonization, by new social movements, new kinds of subjects that are insisting on their co-equal status with the people writing that avant-garde electronic music at um, yeah. in Cologne, for example. Yeah. Yeah. And w one thing that strikes me on that, um, and uh, this is actually something that interests me about about Ben getting you guys to play it all by ear, and then you all not necessarily all playing it by ear, but John, for instance, producing his own form of notation. Um, and uh -huh. for instance, you have the Anthony Braxton pieces there, and Anthony Braxton is all, you know, has his own, you know, right. radical and strange uh, forms of notation that aren't normally there. And what right. you get with recorded sound and audio is you get that kind of immediacy 
that allows you to like remember it in your own different way. Um, sometimes like kind of wrong, uh, and you could like notate it in a different way. While you know, I think the conventional way of learning these pieces of music is you go to a conservatory and then first you learn how to speak their language uh, and right. use the notation system, and then you learn how to translate that into what you play. But here, there's kind of like a, a middleman of cultural institution not there, and you like have that immediate affect, like, I love this, I want to make that sound. Um, and so, yeah. <laughs> oh, I just yeah. happen to have a, uh, Anthony Braxton score right here. Yeah. This is one that, that he wrote out for me when we recorded together. This is what I was meant to play. <laughs> I'm meant to play a, a bar of 2-4 with a 1-8 attached with a uh, square coming out of a... Uh, diagonal line and a circle coming out of a different squiggle with a brown wave wave going through it you know and it's just page after page <laughs> just to i just happen to have that nearby when when you said that i thought i should go grab it but it's great how you feel like you make sense of it yourself uh and like throughout this thing it's like it's a cover record but at the same time it doesn't feel like a cover record it feels like you made sense of all of these tracks on your own and then not only did you make sense of them individually, but you then made a, a kind of like full landscape of sense of them, which is like one of the, the lovely things and is why I think I was drawn to kind of this like landscape and like forest. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Wow, that's cool. Thank you. I, I, I really wanted it to be <laughs> these, different, these different interpretations of modernity that clashed with each other. You know, it's like they don't necessarily agree and uh, <laughs> it's not just that that um, <laughs> the institutions that funded a lot of the most expensive European and in some cases American, you know, classical avant-garde music <laughs> were, of course, inherently colonial, inherently racist, but some of the white musicians and composers that are in the list were are were known to be deeply racist you know in their real life and it's it's like um i thought you know i don't know we we just all somehow felt like you could like balance out or that these works could have a conversation with each other somehow you know and, and in a way it's almost like there's almost <laughs> it's like you articulated, uh, Mumindi, in the essay where <laughs> there were these different kind of strains. There was this kind of like affirmative culture, uh, dominant culture, uh, even though even though somebody like Stockhausen was, was not, um, or John Cage were total weirdos as far as the main dominant culture, as far as the mainstream was concerned, they, they could only do the kind of work that they did and continue to have a career doing it because of funding, institutions, uh, uh, you know, uh, of uh, of you know, large military countries, capitalist countries, and stuff. And uh, <laughs> the the uh, so they had one, they were kind of one strain uh, that that was arguing for the continuation of nationalized funding for the arts. Then you find stuff like <laughs> Morricone or, or like the Knight Rider guy, Stu, Stu Phillips, who are like obviously listening to modern classical music or, you know, the, the people who did the Star Trek uh, soundtracks. You know, these are people clearly trained in classical music but are now using it to serve commercial purposes as soundtracks and stuff. Their music's still quite sophisticated, but they have to churn it out really fast, and they're just on a salary or whatever. <laughs> and then they don't get they don't get famous in the in the halls of of uh, you know uh, in the museum world. And then there was the then there's the kind of like <laughs> the voivods and the all tomorrow's parties, which is this kind of disillusioned, you know. Um, <laughs> talking, you know, being more frank about, wait a second, capitalism, it, it, we're literally watching it destroy the world. We're watching, we're watching the, the same institutions that we're all lauding and, that, who, and whose output we are uh, teaching ourselves 
because Voipod was also a really avant-garde band that always always listening to Stravinsky and like putting a lot of atonal, you know, classical references in their music. It's like at the same time they're saying, look, it's this bleak, there's no future. This this society that made that music possible, we're watching it collapse. We're we're we are on the cusp of a dystopia. And then the final strain that I felt was in there <laughs> was something, an Afrofuturist strain that, that, uh, that was the one out of all of them that maybe didn't buy in to that original institution. It's not an original, it's the, the one that I was originally talking about. That, that late 50s, you know, 60s classical music, uh, American European avant-garde establishment academies and and uh, and commissions and stuff. It's like they, the the Afrofuturist artists that we covered on the record were people who, you know, some of them remained impoverished their whole life. Some of them became very successful, like George Clinton. Or, um, but uh, they uh, created their own version of history, their own story uh, that is kind of the only one that doesn't end with hopelessness, you know, out of all the four strains. And so, I don't know, for me, just the act of doing, of like trying to make the record I felt like I learned something in that process um, ab about that, you know. And I think that I think that that's become a mainstream realization in this summer, you know, um, wh where people <laughs> who had previously felt somewhat comfortable with their position in society are watching it. You know, with the pandemic, they're watching it collapse. And they're they're watching as they may realize uh, <laughs> that uh, that they might be on the chopping block as well. And therefore, uh, uh, they're casting around for any wisdom that might uh, help them survive uh, in a very threatening environment. And you find that uh, that it's many black American writers of this same period are the ones that people are beginning to now turn to a lot and quote a lot on social media, for instance, about police abolition. You know, there's suddenly some wisdom there. Someone who already had been devoting their life to the study of that issue um, and they're not having to panic and come, well, what do we do, what do we do? There are people who already had been thinking it through for many decades and, and their uh, work is suddenly being appreciated on a different scale. Yeah. <laughs> what do we got? What about some of these questions? Why is Satomi being so quiet? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think she's moved this whole time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> huh? well, That'd be the greatest twist if at the it, at the very end she just the, puts the mic down slowly and, and everything fades oh, to black. Just... <laughs> she just commented a, a, a cat in a box. I'm not sure what that means. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, that was just that was just uh, our experience of it. Um, we were really, really excited when Joyful Noise was interested in helping us release it, even though it's free. <laughs> um, and we knew that uh, there was not going to be any money to be made from selling LPs of this thing. Um, and we just wanted it to be a gift. Uh, um, and so um, 
joyful noise being willing to put in work. Um, Ryan Hover, for instance, the one who's been uh, operating the uh, live stream that we're watching now, and he helped assemble Satomi's drawings into the, uh, and Anne Muindi's um, essay into the poster and the album artwork. And, and uh, you know, they've uh, been incredibly helpful to us. Um, so I just wanted to thank Joyful Noise yeah. for, for like, making this possible. Yeah. Making the supported version possible otherwise it would have been what you said then it would have been a thing we performed once and then had some like keepsake you know in like audio files or whatever yeah. it's like we can turn it into a thing and feel lucky totally concur <laughs> and and jess who's who's actually physically holding the picture of satomi at her house right now <laughs> I think it's. I think it'd be shakier if she was actually holding it up right now. Yeah, know? that's true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Incredible control. Yeah. Oh, ah, there she is. Well, there goes Jack. Yeah. yeah. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Serious thanks to to everyone. To it's it's a, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> well. Should we all turn on our our our, uh, our audio to get the feedback going? Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. <coughs> Trying it. John, John, always always waiting for when he can finally get the feedback. Oh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> thanks for uh, tuning in, everybody. Uh, thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks, you guys, for having us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've really enjoyed this. It's been great to, to share the debut with you. Let's see you again. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>